Military service members and veterans face all of the health problems that confront the general population. However, they also face some unique challenges. If they are in combat, life-threatening traumatic injuries are a major concern. There are also the risks of health problems from exposure to environmental hazards, such as contaminated water, chemicals, and infections. Being in the military also exposes individuals to emotional stresses and separation from family that can put service members and veterans at risk for a variety of mental health problems like anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, substance abuse, and even suicide. Many of these issues can persist into civilian life long after active duty. With over 23 million veterans in the United States and over 370,000 in Minnesota, the health of veterans should be a concern for all of us. We'll talk about the health issues facing veterans and the things being done to address those issues on today's episode of A Public Health Journal. Please stay tuned. Welcome to A Public Health Journal, a program that explores public health issues facing our society today and tomorrow. The host of the show is Dr. Ed Ellinger, Commissioner of Health for the State of Minnesota. A Public Health Journal is sponsored by the Minnesota Department of Health, and the Hennepin County Human Services and Public Health Department, all working together towards the goal of healthy people living in healthy communities. Welcome to a Public Health Journal. Today we're going to look at some of the health issues facing veterans in Minnesota. With over 370,000 veterans living in Minnesota, veterans are a significant segment of our society and their level of health significantly impacts the overall health of the state. Given their unique contributions to our country and their unique needs, both the federal and state governments have set up Departments of Veteran Affairs to address the needs of veterans. Today, I've invited the Commissioner of Minnesota's Department of Veterans Affairs to join us. He is retired Major General Larry Shelato. Commissioner Shelato is charged with assisting the state's 370,000 veterans and their families. His responsibilities as Commissioner include oversight of Minnesota's five state veterans homes and the broad range of programs and services offered through the Minnesota Department of Veterans Affairs. Larry, welcome to our program. Well, thank you for having me. And, and it's important to have you here because veterans, they say 370,000 veterans, that's, that's more veterans than college students, post-secondary education. I mean, it's a huge population. So let's, let's kind of define the universe. What, what do you consider a veteran? What's officially veteran status in Minnesota? Uh, a, a veteran is on the official status for the federal. And there's federal and state hmm. laws and rules and regulations. On the federal side, uh, they have been in, in active duty. Uh, they, the, the services, Army, Navy, Marines, Air Force. Um, and when they go in, they've been on active duty, uh, not for training, but on active duty for 180 days or more. And uh, generally, if we go back to my era, it was uh, the Vietnam era. We had a concept called the draft, mm -hmm. and if you were 18 years old, you registered with the Selective Service, and they kept a nice big algorithm and a draw, and uh, I tell the story of myself. I was going to graduate from college, uh, interviewed for a job, had it all lined up, and they said, uh, there's just one question you got to answer. Where are you with the draft board? They said, well, I'll go find out. Okay, do that, and then we're set to go. I go down to the draft board, they have a big IBM printout sheets, they go through it, they find my name, and they say, well, you're graduating in June, correct? Yep. Well, you'll get your notice in either April or May, you're mm -hmm. going. So all my plans were out the window, and that was how I entered. And then uh, right at the end of uh, the Vietnam era, they eliminated the draft, so now it became a very uh, selective or enlistment-focused uh, service. And you start seeing a number of people. There's actually what I consider to be two groups. We had uh, the group that said, you know, I really don't know what I want to do. I'm out of high school and so forth. I'm going to take a couple of years off. I'll go in the military, and I'll, like my brother did. He went in the Marines, uh, spent two years there, uh, three years actually, and then came back and then went on to college and mm -hmm. pursued his gear. He, Kind of. It's been the tradition, you know, some people can get their lives together, figure out what That's they're going right. to do, and military and, is a good and way And the do discipline that. was there. And then we have a lot of people, like in the Guard and Reserve, that said, uh, in fact, uh, when I was adjutant general, our number one recruiting tool by far was the college tuition assistance. So they wanted to go to college. How would they pay for it? So they would enjoy the guard. So that's the we were the known as the weekend warriors. Mm -hmm. uh, one weekend a month and uh, two weeks uh, during the summer for our training. 
and we were the uh, classic reserve that would be available should a conflict occur. Mm -hmm. And as you know, uh, since 9-11, uh, in fact, Minnesota, with the 1st Brigade, has the longest deployed brigade in Iraq. Uh, active guard, reserve, yeah. you name it. So, so we're seeing a lot of these people who originally uh, joined to go to get their education found uh, themselves uh, wearing the uniform and being deployed overseas. So that's created a whole set of issues, I think was right. the reason for this discussion. Right, yeah, so, so just in terms of the veteran status, you know, in the past when you were reserve or National Guard, if you weren't in active duty for 180, you didn't be, you weren't officially then a veteran. That is correct. Yeah, but yeah. now, I mean, most of them have served. Uh, yes. suspect, I understand Minnesota has one of the highest percentages of, of guard and reserves act in active duty. Is that that is correct. That is correct. And, and so, so then what, what kind of exposures, or, or first of all, you said there's a federal definition and state definition. How does federal and state differ? Well, the, 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 the federal is, is where the, uh, the state has some, I'll, just, I'll leave that for it. I'll just focus on the federal first just to uh, take a look at it. What we found, for example, when we deployed our troops, I'll, I'll just give you some of the interesting things. The, uh, when we deployed our troops overseas to Iraq and Afghanistan, when they came back home, the feds say, in the first 90 days, you can get a free dental exam and in that dental exam, uh, you can, uh, if you need some major work, we'll be taken care of. And surprisingly, what we found is the sands of Iraq impacted a lot of teeth, and there's people coming back with serious teeth issues. That's one side of the fence. But then administratively, as the adjutant general at that time, we found that the military said, they went out and asked the troops, what's the one thing when you come back home that you'd really like? And the troops basically said, just leave me alone for a while. I want to get back to my family, and I want to just kind of relax. So they gave them 90 days off before they had to report back mm -hmm. to duty. Well, you have to have your dental work taken care of within the first 90 days to get the benefit, and they weren't coming back uh, you know, until yeah. then. So those are some of the issues that were going on. So we said, no, we're going to force them to come back. And that was one of the genesis of the Yellow Ribbon Program where the family and everyone come back. So while they were coming back, we would bring the families in, the parents, grandparents, spouses, the kids, and say, here are the things that they need to do. Yes, you'll take care of them when they come back home. You'll get mom's favorite meal and all of that other good stuff. But by day four or five, they will be home alone. Mm -hmm. So we had to deal with physical issues, mental issues, employment issues, uh, you name it, marital issues. Uh, so the, the, there's a whole series of triage, societal triage, if you will, that was taking place as they were coming back home. So the feds, the federal government, the federal VA system is, uh, there's a lot of Vietnam veterans, my generation, that say they didn't want to have anything to do with it. Well, this is not your dad's VA anymore. This is modern, state-of-the-art type of things, and I'll explain later okay. how Minnesota works, but. They would come back, uh, get taken care of, get their, what we call the azimuth check. Here's where you are, here's your point in time. Now we know, if you need special care, we got it arranged for you. If you're fine, keep, keep checking up on you, making sure it's doing it. And uh, the uh, number one therapy for returning veterans is a good job. So they can take care of their family, take mm -hmm. care of their kids, and do all those types of things. So we see all this emphasis on employment or they can go back to school, uh, but we found too that uh, sometimes going back to school, uh, their peers have moved on for two or three years, and oh, by the way, they grew up a lot yeah. two or three years, so, but they're doing very, very well. Right. Well, I want to talk about some of the issues they're facing, how things have changed you know, yes. from the Vietnam to now, but first we need to take a little break. All right. We'll be back right after this message. Body language can tell you all sorts of things. 
like someone is having a stroke. Know the sudden signs. Learn fast. Face drooping. Arm weakness. Speech difficulty. Time to call 911 and get them to a hospital immediately. Learn the body language and spot a stroke fast. Welcome back. We're talking about the health of veterans in Minnesota with the commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Veterans Affairs, uh, Larry Shelato. Uh, Larry, you had alluded to the fact that you know we've had uh, the military change dramatically, just how people get mm -hmm. conscripted or in, inducted into the military in the last 35, 40 years. Uh, the kinds of things that they've been doing over the, that period of time mm -hmm. has also changed. Our, our conflicts are markedly different. How do you see the, the veterans changing and their needs changing over the last uh, several decades? Oh, I, well, uh, I, I kind of categorize them, and it's, uh, it's both era and also age. Mm -hmm. uh, as you know, our World War, our, we, World War II generation is, is steadily uh, passing on. Uh, it's, it's now was the largest. It's now not the largest. The Vietnam group is technically right now the largest population of veterans in the state of Minnesota. But of that group, there's a lot of activities uh, to take care of, and we have our five homes, and these are nursing homes. These are homes dedicated to taking care of those veterans that need special, high-intensity care. Um, it's, not, it's more than just a nursing home. It's it's, it's it's just making sure that they, in their final years, are well taken care of. Uh, we also, then as, as you work through, uh, we have our the state agencies. I have staff that are dealing with employment, and they work with the Department of Labor and Minnesota's DEED, Economic Development, just to make sure that there's opportunities uh, available so that they, uh, they can compete and apply for the, those jobs. And we've had employers that uh, we made uh, across a major hurdle, you would see them, but we now make it legal to say veterans are encouraged to apply. Mm -hmm. you know, it's it's veterans strange. preference. Yeah. Well, yeah, and, but it's, there are strange laws out there. But anyway, those are things that are happening to, on that side. But then also we now have the new, uh, and I want to make something very clear. The military is just a microcosm of society in general. You'll hear public people saying there's a high suicide rate in the, among the military. Statistically, I will show you that they're consistent with the general population. Probably even if the numbers, the difference is the military keeps very accurate and serious records dealing with it, and I'm not sure how many things in the private or public sector are kind of not, it was an accident yeah. type of deal. So we're just a microcosm, but the VA system on the federal side and on the state side, the state, my mission on the state side is to help manage the resources provided by the federal government. So we work very, very closely with the federal VA. I just came back from Washington, D.C. I got, even got stuck in a snowstorm. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but uh, we work with them to make sure here are the things that are happening. Now, what you'll see in Minnesota recently, was since you know, really 9-11, the Minneapolis uh, and St. Cloud VAs, and Minnesota is, is part of what is called Vision 23, and we have four major hospitals that we work with, the Minneapolis Veterans Hospital, St. Cloud, then you have Fargo, and Sioux Falls. So like the Laverne, that area, will, so there's area, but they're all part of the same group. We're dealing with telemedicine. Uh, we're dealing with an, an uh, innovative thing that has happened to do outreach, because you know Minnesota is a rural state, is uh, they call them CBOX, Community-Based Outreach Clinics. Mm -hmm. But I like it because it's triage. Uh, my old hometown was Alexandria. They have uh, a CBOC there. And uh, so the veterans, uh, after they've, you know, working with their county veteran service officer, and if the audience remembers one thing, they have to remember county veteran service officer. Every county has them. Are they part of your organization? They're part, well, they, they're, they're employees of the county, but we work very, very closely with them, help them get trained. They are the conduit to the federal mm -hmm. system, the paperwork people. 
-hmm. get you registered, logged in, and, and find out what you, you can and can't do. So, but the CBOC is like triage. Uh, you go there and you'll get the routine, here's your checkup, here's your shots, and so forth, and hmm, there's something strange here. So I'm going to send you to, in Alexandria's case, you'd go to St. Cloud or Fargo, depending on it, and they'd take a look at it and we'll take care of it here. Or, hmm, this is a little more serious. And then you go to an even more uh, resourced uh, facility, i.e. Minneapolis, to, to take care. So it, it's just the, like the medical system on the private sector. Mm -hmm. uh, Di different levels of care. Different levels, you know. You, and, like you say. It, for, I go from a GM, or, you know, general practitioner to a specialist mm -hmm. and work your way up. Yeah, so just like you say, they're, they're a microcosm. The veterans are a microcosm of the state. The system is a microcosm of the system. That's the, right. The and that they actually, the they're also probably one of the strongest national research centers uh, in, in doing. I'm part of a uh, million uh, veteran uh, study. They're going to give me a colonoscopy. I drew the long star because yeah. there's two systems. One's a sample, one's versus the full mm -hmm. traditional colonoscopy. So half of them will go under one system, the other half will go under the other, and then they'll do the studies to determine I think what they're really trying to do is validate the one mm -hmm. the less invasive to see if that, that the degree of accuracies are there. So, yeah. Well, I, I want to talk more about the services and then some of the specific issues that are, are focusing here in Minnesota and, uh, and sort of see what the future holds. But first, we need to take another little break. Okay. And we'll be back right after this message. dealing with the daily struggles of caring for a loved one, we hear you. That's why AARP created a community with experts and other caregivers to help us better care for ourselves and the ones we love. Welcome back. We're talking about the health of veterans in Minnesota with Commissioner Larry Shelato, the head of the Minnesota Department of Veterans Affairs. Larry, you talked about you know the the county based uh, mm -hmm. operations, but there are also a lot of other folks that are engaged. And you talked about Deed and Department of Labor, but you also what about uh, the, the VFWs and and American Legion and the University of Minnesota and Minsku and and the tribes? I mean, there are lots oh. of other folks. I mean, you know, what are how do you interact with all of those different groups that have some impact on veterans? Uh, <laughs> That's a good question because we do. We do definitely. It's all about partnerships. So one of the things that's going on, especially with, with when the war was, is going on, uh, everyone says, I need to be part of this. I need to contribute. Uh, whether it be research studies, uh, the mm -hmm. University of Minnesota, as you mentioned, Active has a Yellow Ribbon program, working with their students, because a lot of our students want to go back and get their education. So the university and Minsk system bent over backwards. Uh, I'm a former Minsk uh, college president. So I called up one of the peers and says, I've got a problem. Would you like more students who have a GI Bill? Yes, okay, we sat down. They work with us very, very closely on that. Uh, the, the counties, the uh, I kind of lost my thought here. Uh, ask me again. Yeah, with the University of Minnesota, Minsku, uh, tribes. Tribes. Because I mean, I know oh, the, yes. the, the, the American Indian community is, is, is very, the, very engaged the, in military. Per, you know, per, uh, statistically, uh, they are probably the largest uh, military member uh, doing, and um, we work. With the, there's a Minnesota Tribal Council, and uh, we work with them, and uh, we've we've done something that was I consider. <laughs> unique uh, is we've worked with uh, our, through our budgets and so forth to help support the tribal veteran service officers so so it's not just a county veteran service officer but these independent nations have their own veteran service officer we help support to make sure they get the benefits because uh, uh, peer-to-peer becomes more important mm -hmm. especially 
Mm -hmm. I'm very proud. Yeah. What, what are the biggest challenges you face as commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Veterans Affairs? Well, the, the, the biggest challenge is uh, the cost of medical care. You know, and, and the the benefits. And there's two things on the on the program and services side. We're a 2.1 veterans in the state of Minnesota are a 2.1 billion dollar industry. 900 million goes to the take, maintaining of the, the the hospitals and so forth. The rest of that money uh, goes to retirement uh, pensions and so forth. What the counties don't realize, and I try to say this to the county commission, what they don't realize is that you have veterans in that community that are older who get a pension from the military and they get a social security check and you know what? They live above the radar screen. They're quite, they don't run into the county commissioner and say, here's my veterans check, here's my social security check. But they're living, they're taking good care of themselves, they get some medical assistance. And yet, a lot of people say, well, I didn't go through my checkbook, so it must not exist. So that's what I like to mm -hmm. go out to your show, is, is we need to let the community know that, hey, there's a lot of things going on under the major radar screen uh, on that side. So the, uh, the veterans are our economic engine uh, that way. So those monies come into play. Now the state we're looking at with the, the veterans' homes, uh, the the number one enemy I have on the home side is distance, Minnesota distance, because if we have a home in St. Cloud that'll, for you, but your spouse of 50 years lives in West Overshoe, Minnesota, way up north, in their final twilight years of their life, they're physically separated. Mm -hmm. So you're going to hear a lot in the legislature about how can we bring these veterans closer to home to the family, to the community. And uh, so the metro is the largest concentration of veterans, but we have communities uh, in northern and western and uh, Minnesota that say we too want to have a smaller home so that people can see dad or mom and uh, in those years and take yeah. care of so, them. So you've got a complex job because you have to take care of some acute problems and you have to have some long-term issues like long-term care. Oh, yes. Uh, which is in nursing homes and a, in a, a yeah. specialized nursing home in particular is, yeah. is and a again, complex the, thing. And then the, that care too, for example, uh, the Minneapolis campus has an adult day can, daycare center because what you you know this uh, is the, the, our, our generation, if you will, staying at home longer and longer and longer because the cost uh, is prohibitive. Mm -hmm. Well, what we have established, and we, the second one in the nation, is we converted a building so that you can take dad to our adult day, drop him off with dad or mom. They're with other veterans. They get taken care of and so forth, and you can pick them up on the way home. So you have that type of thing where you can get them out and have someone taken care of. And all, the VA also has the ability to have some people come in and help check up on you, make sure your meds are taken care of, uh, and that the house is clean and, and those types of things. Uh, now you see cottage industries being created all across the country, I think, on, with these kind of angels that come in and, and make sure that your house is cleaned and taken care of. So this whole you know, generation, the baby boomers, if you will, is changing uh, a lot of the care that needs to be taken yeah. medically. One last issue before we run out of time is the GI Bill. I know that the GI Bill after World War II was a huge thing in, in home construction and actually lifting a whole bunch of people into the middle class. Are people using the 9-11 GI Bill uh, as much as they can should? Yes, they are very much so. They, uh, the, G, the new GI Bill uh, in fact, in the state has helped some of even the older veterans uh, with supplemental state uh, contributions to the GI Bill that has expired, so that all generations can go in. And uh, but uh, the GI Bill is very, very good. So really, what happens when someone comes back out of the service? They get it. They have to make kind of a decision. You've got this route you can take, or this route, and so forth. And then. That's where the county veterans service mm -hmm. officers. And one of the things we did do, and we support this with our agencies, we've embedded subject matter experts in all the campuses so that they can sit down and make sure things are taken care of properly so that, 
because the last thing is a student returning from a combat zone is to get hassled by uh, right. the business office. So. <laughs> okay. Well, you, you have a, a complex world that you, you live in, yeah. and uh, it's a huge issue for this, our state. Thank you for the, the service that you're using. Yeah. And we just scratched the surface of all the needs of oh. veterans. We'll have to have you come <laughs> back again to about it. Yeah, there's ch chat some more. Not even, yeah, even not even a scratch yet. Right. I mean, it's this is a very complex uh, study. So you and I will get together again, and we'll, Good. we'll, we'll talk. Thanks for being with us. You bet. And I'll be back with a closing comment right after this message. is hard down those books are heavy my sport is football but my passion is education right up here. so every year I take promising high schoolers on a college tour to show them that higher education means a brighter future <laughs> my name is Namdi Asamoah I don't just wear the shirt I live it you can be a reader tutor or mentor too take the pledge at liveunited.org slash volunteer do you wear this There are some basic principles that underlie public health. Four of these principles are that in public health, the focus is on the health of the entire population. Prevention is valued as the best way of maintaining a healthy population. Being prepared and having systems in place to respond to crises is essential. And collaboration is the preferred approach to problems. When you stop and think about it, the agencies that make up our uniform services are organized around the same principles, keeping everyone safe, recognizing that prevention is preferred over intervention, responding effectively to emergencies, and being good partners. Given that the definition of public health is what we as a society do collectively to assure the conditions in which people can be healthy, it is evident that our uniform services are a major part of our public health system. The veterans in our state were trained in these principles of prevention, protection, and service, and I'm sure most still embrace those values. That means that we have a well-trained and dedicated public health workforce living in communities throughout our state. Certainly some veterans have some unique needs that we must address, but a much greater number have the skills, abilities, and motivation to be part of an effort to make Minnesota safer and healthier. Veterans can make unique contributions to the collective action that is required to assure the conditions in which people can be healthy. We should welcome them as part of our public health team. That's all for today. Thanks for watching. I hope you can join us again next time on a Public Health Journal.